And our first presentation is from uh, Dustin Thomas from the uh, Minnesota DOT. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I, I, this uh, presentation is going to be focused on, on peer caps and specifically uh, really two parts, how we're documenting the condition of our peer caps and then also um, how we're using that information to analyze uh, for repair projects. So this issue came, I guess, has come to the forefront more recently. We started analyzing more pier caps, more of the existing structure when we do uh, preservation work, and we're finding some caps just aren't, aren't rating as well as we thought they would. As I mentioned earlier, I'd, be, I'd welcome any input from any other states on kind of how they're handling this issue. We recently added a section to our bridge inspection field manual to perform or to document and perform how, how we do enhanced pier cap inspections. As I mentioned, shear cracking has received greater attention in recent years after we uh, changed our practices for which elements get reviewed when we're doing, get load rated when we're doing uh, bridge repair projects. So I, after that, we started seeing that we're maybe some getting enough information with our inspections and we're finding, I guess, more cracks too. We're looking for them probably a little bit more closely. The goal of this guidance is just to uh, determine when en enhanced peer caps inspections are needed and then also to provide good documentation for our bridge designers when they're analyzing for repair projects. So some of the risk factors that we see specifically in related to cracking is bridges built prior to say like the 1980s, we've, we've really seen you know lower design loads, uh, there's been a lot of code changes, a lot of the detailing practices were not the same as we do today. Today we'll use closed stirrups, sometimes we had, uh, there's bridges with lap stirrups uh, for shear reinforcement or um, uh, primary bars that uh, maybe aren't developed the way we would today with hooks on the ends, those types of things. So trying to work through that and, and in terms of risk factors we see, we kind of use 1980 as kind of a a break point for when those types of issues are, are more common. In terms of cracking, you know, longer caps with fewer columns, um, you're maybe going to see more cracks if you have really shallow, shallow dimensions for, for the given structure. Uh, and then if you have a uh, cantilever with, say, two, two beams on it, that's another case where, you know, maybe see more cracking. On the deterioration side, uh, anything, anytime you have joints above uh, up here, or uh, drainage systems, you know, that's often where we're seeing more deterioration. Uh, and then some of the, sometimes we may have some cracking because we've added dead load in the past. You know, maybe you had a repair project 25 years ago and it wasn't checked then. And um, so you're, you're seeing some of the results of that. Why is uh, enhanced inspection necessary? Um, you know, the caps can be non-redundant. Uh, a shear failure can be non-ductile. So there's that, that risk uh, element there. We also are trying to create a baseline uh, so that we can see the change in condition over time. And then really just an inspection from the ground, providing notes on the cracking really isn't sufficient when you want to do a, a design analysis as part of a repair project. So understanding the, the deterioration that's out there, the cracking pattern, the width of the cracks, that type of thing can really uh, help our, our designers. And then also we're finding now that sometimes we'll do an analysis and there may be some issues and the load rating may be say there's some you know, higher stresses in certain areas, uh, but we're not seeing the cracking there when we look out in the field. It may be somewhere else or may not be any cracking at all. So we're hopeful that we can, by getting more information on certain bridges, we can help calibrate our, our uh, models that we use to evaluate uh, existing pier caps. So we have identified certain criteria where we're going to require an enhanced inspection, and we have an agency-defined element for shear cracking. And so if it's condition state three or four, uh, that's when this, this type of uh, enhanced inspection is required. We also may be requiring it because we have an upcoming project and when I do a design analysis or there's some other uh, load rating reason for looking at the caps, or it, it could be due to deterioration, right? We're seeing a lot of deterioration um, from leaking, previously leaking joints or drainage systems. So just in, in terms of, just to kind of give you the scale, I guess, or how often this comes up, um, in our metro district in Minnesota, we have uh, roughly 1,500 bridges, and about 1,100 of those are uh, more span bridges. So this top criteria uh, identifies 125 bridges that, uh, I guess, need this enhanced inspection. Um, and so far, we've gotten through about 80 of those, primarily using uh, consultants. And then once we get through the required ones, eventually, I guess, we'll get to the recommended ones. So there's a little less cracking here, and then um, some of the risk factors that are combined with that. And I guess the other thing this really helps us is just understand, you know, from an inspection report, an inspector may say, hey, I see sure cracks out here, but when you actually look at it, it's really only shrinkage cracks. So trying to determine the difference between the two um, so that we can properly uh, analyze the bridge is important. So we would not do an enhanced inspection just for, for shrinkage cracks. 
Uh, so just the guidance then on how we document uh, this enhanced inspection. Um, so it's a hands-on inspection. So you got it. Oftentimes uh, you're going to need access equipment. Oftentimes you need traffic control. Um, we're marking the ends of the crack, putting a date there. The narrower cracks, we're just describing them uh, within our inspection notes, but the wider cracks, we're actually mapping them out and then uh, either sketching them or putting them on a you know, high resolution uh, photo. We want to document both sides of the pier cap uh, so we can understand if, you know, if it's a sheer crack, if it's through on both, on both faces. And if we've had previous inspections, we want to be looking for if, if those cracks are changing at all, if they're propagating or um, you know, if they're staying in their, their current condition. And then oftentimes if we've done, say, an analysis, we want to check the hot spots from that analysis. If it's saying defic it's deficient in some areas, really check those areas closely to make sure we don't have cracking there uh, to kind of help, like I said, uh, calibrate our, our design models. Some cases we have installed uh, crack gauges. Uh, and I got a photo here at the bottom of, of a crack gauge. So if we have an existing bridge that's, um, you know, it has some cracking, but it, hey, it's been in service for for 30 or 40 years. This might be one way, or one way I guess we're looking at it, monitoring that cracking, see if it's getting any different, or if it's staying the same. And that may help us uh, not, not add load restrictions to that bridge, or give us confidence in, in not having to you know, load restrict the bridge. Uh, and then I also threw in, a, I guess, a sketch here uh, from one of our inspection um, reports, just showing you know, some of the cracking in one of our caps, and kind of how that's documented. As I said, sometimes it's documented in photos as well um, instead of that sketch. Talked a little bit about the cracking. Also, if you have uh, delaminations or, or spalling, we want to sound the cap, um, identify those in either photos or, or in sketches. And we're asking that our inspectors not try to estimate the section loss on exposed rebar. Uh, we find it's really hard to do that in the field um, unless you have complete access to that bar and you have a caliper out there. So we're, we're asking them just to, to more so say if it's minor, moderate, or severe section loss. And then uh, at the time we do the analysis, um, we can, we can uh, the evaluation engineer can look at it and uh, make that determination on, on what to put into their model. Um, and we do have some research ongoing to try to estimate um, uh, how much, so if you got a, a bar of a certain diameter and you have uh, a certain amount of cover, you know, how much section loss does it take before you start uh, spalling concrete? Just to try to help, uh, help us quantify a little bit what kind of section loss we're looking at on some of our deteriorated caps. So here's another example of one of our inspection reports. This time we had a photograph, stitched some photos together, some software, and then identify the unsound areas. And then oftentimes you can now measure within that software, measure uh, areas. Uh, that sort of thing. So that's really helpful for designers. They really like seeing that doing their analysis. So now moving on past that documentation piece, um, I want to talk a little bit about repair projects and specifically which projects or which work types we decided to actually load rate these existing caps doing a design analysis on it versus, um, you know, like our past practices, not really not been looking at them, you know. The past we'd look at the superstructure and then unless there's a lot of dead load added uh, really hadn't looked at the cap so can't we can't look at all of them uh, you know it takes time to do that design analysis so that's why we've really developed this uh, the screening tool um, but it has to happen early right it has to happen in that scoping phase you know four or five years out from letting so we've developed these risk risk factors we're still kind of fine-tuning on which which caps we're gonna analyze you know there's kind of a balance if you look at too many uh, it takes, takes a lot of design resources, um, may not be necessary, but on the flip side, if you're not looking at enough of them, you know, you may, you may miss some risk factors that are, that are out there. Continuing to refine that screening process, um, you know, looking at things like how much dead load's added, uh, what's the investment level in the bridge, are you doing just a, you know, a shorter term repair, or is this more like a 50 year fix, where you looking at, you know, the geometry of the pier cap, uh, obviously those rebar detailing changes, uh, looking at the, that, that risk factor as well in our screening process. Some of the work types that may require design analysis of pier caps for adding dead load, you know, say with a deck overlay or say a barrier, you know, oftentimes the, bar the new barrier is heavier that meets today's uh, crash standards. On rehab projects where we're making, say, a deck replacement or a superstructure replacement, much larger investment of the bridge, we're going to analyze, you know, more caps, uh, more pier caps and those types of uh, projects. So the preservation projects with really little or no dead load added, we're, we're not going to be analyzing those, you know, unless there's some 
some condition issues out there. You know, in our inspection manual now, we feel we have a good uh, tool to get good and consistent documentation. Uh, that's really important in doing the analysis. You know, another anal reason for doing that analysis early, you know, I mentioned the scheduling and it takes time, but also it could really add cost to your project. If you have to do, say, shoring to do some repairs, or if you have to do some additional strengthening that wasn't really recognized based on condition, but based on, you know, the, the load rating analysis, um, you know, it, it's going to add cost to your project. Um, so, um, Another reason, I guess, to, to get at it early, and especially if we have to, to do shoring for live load, want to know that early because that adds a lot of complexity as well. Uh, so some of the repair types that we've done when we've had to strengthen pier caps, this is kind of the uh, a photo here, of kind of our, our brute force approach. Just put a, a thin wall in, an infill wall between the columns uh, that extends from the footing uh, all the way up to the underside of the pier cap. Um, so that's one method that's kind of the uh, I guess in most cases, it's, it's pretty cost effective as well. Um, sometimes you have really tall cap or tall piers where, you know, this isn't as cost effective. So we've, you know, done secondary pier caps, um, done a little bit of FRP to strengthen our, our caps, but we're still not real comfortable with that if there's any deterioration out there uh, already where we've had to do a lot of patching. So um, I'd really like to try to do the, the titanium um, uh, bars, I think that looks really promising as well, but so far we haven't done uh, a project with that yet uh, for strengthening. Just to kind of summarize uh, some of our, I guess, our best practices that we've developed related to pure caps is you definitely want to identify them early during that scoping phase uh, so that you can make good decisions based on good information to make decisions. Design analysis may identify strengthening needs that, you, that weren't apparent based on the condition of the caps. So you want to know that up front so you can set your budget properly for your project and know what repairs are out there. It's been a few projects where I thought we were just going to do a mill and overlay and joints and maybe some updates on the barriers and we would be good and now you have maybe an extra hundred thousand dollars in, in pier cap repairs you weren't anticipating so uh, trying to find that out early on is very important um, just in the the plan preparation process but, but also just um, you know, set, setting your budget properly. I guess this probably goes without saying, but especially in a, a snow and ice state like Minnesota, we use a lot of de-icing chemicals on our bridge decks. So really getting after those joints if they start leaking, um, repairing them as soon as you can. Um, and then also drainage systems are kind of the other uh, Achilles heel, I would say, where we've seen a lot of deterioration of pier caps. You know, some of that's just detailing practices from the past, like, you know, the 1960s, a lot of times those joints weren't really watertight when they were brand new. So, you know, a lot of chlorides probably got into the caps early on in the, in the bridge's life. Um, but we're really trying to um, focus on those types of repairs. You get a high level, I guess, a high return on investment on, on, on that expansion joint, say, uh, repair versus um, waiting till later and having to repair these pier caps. And then we're also looking at our, our, our new designs to try to maybe add a little bit, another level of service life design within our our detailing practices. So trying to make our pier caps more robust um, right out of the gate and give a little more forgiveness if a joint does leak for a period of time, which I guess at some point all joints are going to leak at some point. So, so that could be using high performance concrete in our pier caps, um, increasing the cover, maybe using different rebar types or um, you know possibly some different sealants on our caps that have joints above them. And with that, I, I'll open up to any questions we have and like I mentioned, if any other states are kind of going through this, um, we've kind of asked around a little bit, and I think a lot of DOTs really aren't looking at their caps, pure caps, when they're doing repair projects. Certainly welcome any experience from other DOTs, either through questions now or email me afterwards. The question was for really large bridges, say if you have 30 substructures, um, are you looking at every single cap? And in those cases, we're going to look at the ones that had joints above, because that most likely have some deterioration or, or drainage structures. Um, and then we'll try to kind of group them in similar design types. You know, if they're assuming the span lengths are similar and the, and the details within the cap, we'll kind of use one representative cap for the rest of them. I guess that's how we kind of handle those, those larger structures. And we found generally the deterioration, it, it does vary, but really only under where you have joints. <laughs> So that's where the deterioration is, and that does vary. And so there, on those, we're looking very specifically and um, you're trying to make estimates for section loss specifically. And then the, the joints that are the pier caps that aren't under joints, 
you know, generally, you know, they're pretty in pretty good condition for us. At least that's what we found. The question was, um, you know, a lot of DOTs like MnDOT in the past, we hadn't really looked at these caps, didn't analyze them when we're doing repair projects. So was there an incident that led us to do that? And I, I would, there hasn't been an incident, thankfully. I think we started looking at maybe some projects where we've added a little more dead load and our designer said, hey, we should really check this. And then once you get into it, it really kind of opened things up. And I think we became aware of more more bridges on paper when you do the analysis that have some deficiencies in, in the rating. So that's kind of what led to us kind of opening things up and looking broader at, at more of our projects. Um, once you analyze a few and you see some of the past detailing practices and you see well, that's, that's kind of what led to it. So, but it, I, you know, on the flip side, it's really tough to, you do this analysis and you, you know, there's, um, you know, load factors in there and whatnot, and it's saying you have deficiencies, but you got a structure that's out there for 30 years, and you may be seeing some minor cracking. So there's a balance there that we're still trying to work through and how to respond to that. The question was differentiating between shrinkage cracks and shear cracks. And it is, it is difficult at times, right? And that's why we found our, our inspection reports, you know, we have technicians that do our inspections, and then we have engineers that review them back in the office. And they oftentimes were identifying weren't getting it right, right? We've got this agency defined element for shear cracks and they're saying it, yep, there's shear cracks here when it really was just shrinkage cracks. So it, it is difficult. I think we, we try to look at, at the cracking pattern as an engineer in the office looking at it and saying, does this really make sense? Is this the load path? Is this a load induced crack or is it shrinkage? And sometimes it is kind of difficult to tell. I think those are the cases where if we put, you know, put a crack cage out there or if we do the analysis and then say, now this isn't really, the capacity is fine in this area where we're seeing the cracking, that also gives us uh, confidence that it's really not a load induced crack. It was probably something from, you know, early on in the bridge's life. All right, well, thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.